Hello, today is December 2nd, 2015. I'm meeting today with Mr. Harold Steinoff at his home in Windsor, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Harold, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. I'm glad to have you here. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. <coughs> Well, I was born in Fort Morgan, Colorado, uh, 82 miles from here. We're in uh, March 9th, 1919, right after World War One. Well, my folks had worked in Washington, D.C. and came back to, to, to uh, relocate in uh, Fort Morgan. Uh, we, I grew up, though, mostly in uh, the Denver area and some in, uh, in uh, Nebraska. Went to CSU. Uh, and so, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm a mostly Colorado kid. Yeah. Well, uh, as we were talking prior to turning the camera on, you want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about your uh, your ancestors, and you got some interesting stories in your in your in your background. Yes. Well, uh, my ancestor came, of course, uh, from uh, one of them came from Germany in 1850. My great grandfather came from Germany. He uh, uh, his son, uh, and he, he went to Wisconsin, uh, bought a farm. My, he gave it to his son, it was my grandfather. And uh, he did well at the farm in Wisconsin, but uh, then he had to move to Colorado because of his wife got asthma. <coughs> so he came to Fort Morgan and bought four farms with that one farm mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Spent the rest of his life just managing those farms. That's all he did. And that's what brought you, you said that's what brought your father back to Fort. That's what brought my dad and his, my mother, who they were born, in, they were married in 1917. And uh, then they came back when I was on the way and the war was over. They came back to Fort Morgan to relocate. And that's why I was born there. I never, I did, we didn't spend much time there, though. We moved when I was just real, really very young to Denver. Okay. When my dad became an accountant. Now, uh, any brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, I had uh, uh, had three sisters. They were all younger than I was, and uh, uh, it was Barbara, Marjorie, and Ruth. Two are gone; just two of us left. Mm -hmm. One question I always like to ask you, uh, you and your, your generation, before we get into your your military experience: Do you have much memory? And if so, uh, can you talk a little bit about if your, your, you and your family were affected by the Great Depression. Oh, yes. I'm a Depression kid. You can always tell Depression kids. They're very careful with their money. <laughs> they, they're just not sure they're going to have enough to do what they need to do. And uh, uh, they're very frugal. And uh, so, yes, it definitely left a mark on us. And, and in some ways, I think we left it on our kids. Because they saw that frugality. In fact, one time, <clears throat> I was a <clears throat> after our kids had left home, our two sons had left home. My wife Marion, I bought her a camera. Well, that was unheard of in the early days. I, I, I would have never done that. And so my uh, younger son said to his brother, "We ought to move back home." He figured that, and so that's true. Huh. We had uh, we uh, paid half of their college expense. They had to make the other half, and so uh, uh, we sort of passed the frugality a little bit on to them. No, oh, interesting, interesting. So you grew up, uh, went through the Denver school system, graduated, and then you said you came up here to A and M, or which is now Colorado State. That's right. I was Colorado A&M at that time, and that was that was a wonderful move. I actually went to my first year. Incidentally, I didn't tell you that my my dad later became a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, oh. <clears throat> and uh, he had a uh, pastorate in uh, Jepson, Colorado. That was his very first one, and in Nebraska, and then in Denver, and that's why I went to uh, high school in South High in Denver because he had a he had a church out there. But uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, incidentally, that's, 
I can see now that I had two kinds of tracks in my mind from my background. One was a, uh, a uh, what you might call an, a natural track and the other a supernatural. Spiritual track is a supernatural track. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, legacy I have from my dad, my parents, is mostly supernatural truth. The truth about God. And, 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 and so, uh, <clears throat> so that's what that's, I learned uh, mostly about God. And in fact, in Zips, I well remember one of my earliest memories. Uh, probably when I was six years old. Uh, and a little church in Gypsum, Colorado, which is close to Glenwood Springs. And I, w I was in the congregation in an evening service. I well remember it. And I don't know why my mother wasn't there, but I was sitting with one of the ladies in the congregation and heard my dad preaching. And I was so and enthralled with what he was saying that I began repeating what he said. And she had to shush me. Hmm. Well, that's my first experience I, in my memory that I can remember. But you see, it's a supernatural mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The natural experiences are different because then that deals with, you know, things you can see and hear and touch. And that's what I call natural truth okay. compared to supernatural truth. And uh, my natural truth side came from my, my mother's side. Her, her father, who was a gold miner in California, and his father was. In fact, his father moved there. I think it was in the, it was in the uh, mid uh, what the 1850s, I think, right after the 49, mm -hmm. uh, to California. And then uh, his son, my grandfather, grew up there, came back and mined in Colorado. In, in Empire. And uh, uh, hard rock mining, though, was different because in California it was hydraulic mining. But in, in, California, in Colorado, Colorado, it was hard rock mining. Oh. But the, the hydraulic stuff stayed with him. And that's very interesting, Brad, because <coughs> my grandfather, John Moore, later became the... Uh, the superintendent of the water department in Boulder, Colorado. And this would have been in the 19, starting in the 19, late 1920s, I guess. The 1920s, 1930s. And he died in about, I think it's something like 34, or something like that. But, but his hydraulic mining uh, stood in good mind because you had to learn how to handle pressure water that way. And so he became sort of an expert in managing uh, water under pressure. Huh, wow. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, but anyway, the, what I learned from him, though, was not that so much as it was a love of wildlife that, that re eventually resulted in the career that I had. Right, yeah. And uh, that was he, uh, I remember, well, uh, one of the things I remember with him was hunting grouse, blue grouse, west of Fort Collins, or west of uh, Boulder shot a uh, blue grouse and I was so interested in that bird that started my curiosity that led to a career in, in wildlife biology. I'll be darned. And that was happened before there was such a thing as a career in wildlife biology. <laughs> wow. At that time you went into forestry but nat which was natural resource stuff and uh, so I went into forestry and uh, and at CSU, but before I could go into the CSU, my uh, what I already started to tell you all this stuff for is that my dad was a pastor. He wanted me to go to a church school the first year, partly because he'd already he'd worked with Midland College in Fremont, Nebraska, as a field representative, and uh, he wanted me to go there one year, and so I did. I went to the Midland College in Fremont, Nebraska for the first year. But I did come up and found out from advisors at Colorado College 
what courses I could take there that would be transferable and useful, and including courses like geology that Norman was upper class courses, but I took it at Midland because I knew it would be required here. And uh, but that, so then I came back and went to Colorado and AM College. But anyway, that at that time you had to go into forestry, which I did. Uh, but uh, the wildlife came with one course that I had at uh, at CSU from uh, Les Daniels was his name, and he taught a course game management. It was a bit from a book written by Aldo Leopold, the father of all game management in America. Uh, and, I, and he wrote it, I think, 1933, and, and I, was take, I took that course in about 1939 uh, 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 or 40, and that started my interest in wildlife, partly because I already had it from my grandfather, yeah. but also had it from my uncle, his, uh, my grandfather's son, John, uh, George Morse, who was a fire chief in Boulder, Colorado, but he was a sportsman. And I well remember catching an 18-inch cutthroat trout from from uh, 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 the lake, uh, Boulder's water supply, west of Boulder, uh, Goose Lake. Well, I was a proud kid to hold that 18-inch sure. fish up. But anyway, that's the way I got into my career. Wow, oh, fascinating, fascinating. So you're uh, uh, up at CSU, or A&M, you graduate. Did, now, did you graduate, or did the war come before you uh, were able to graduate? Yes. No, the war came after us, because I graduated in 1941 in okay. June. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, I was working for the Forest Service in, uh, uh, in the summers. Uh, and, and the first summer, 1940, I worked on a lookout at, uh, good, at Twin Sisters in, at uh, Estes Park. So you graduated from CSU your, uh, in June of 41. Yeah, that's right, but I, and I, that was the war came after that. Yeah. But uh, those summers, 40, I worked there, and I also for the timber sale up in the Gray Wall, Ray Walls, west of Fort Collins. Uh, I was a, a, my job was scaling logs for a timber sale. And uh, the, so living in a cabin, that mm. was the start of a cabin career. Okay, uh-huh. Lived in a cabin up there. Uh, on that summer of 41, though, we cruised timber, uh, and they were just beginning to measure timber from aerial photos. They used the aerial photos to map uh, vegetative types on the ground that would have timber in them. And then you ran a line through there to measure a sample of the timber to get an idea of total timber that was available in that area. And uh, so that summer I had a rare, what a wonderful opportunity. It was just new and another you know, fellow and I just graduated together with some foresters that were on permanent appointment. Cruised timber down around what's now Vail, Colorado, yeah. and also west of Fort Collins. And I spent the whole summer that oh. way up near Pigry Park and, and up west near uh, Chambers Lake. And we... Uh, what what happens then is you you learn to identify on an aerial photo a lot of stuff, and that came into use later in the army because that's where I went in the army was uh, actually that direction. But uh, now, now, would you go actually go up in the plane, or you would just analyze the photographs? Uh, well, we went out <coughs> we went out in the field and measured or okay. estimated really. You run a line through the, you, you take a timber type here that has, seems to have uniformity. You run a line through it that's a, a chain wide, which is 66 feet wide, and whatever length it takes to get through the stand, and you estimate the diameter and height of every tree of each species that you're interested in, in that line. Hmm. And you, you keep practicing, so your estimate is pretty good. You, you can check it periodically with a stick uh, that measures the diameter and a stick that measures the height. And, uh, uh, but the, the, the thing is, you've got to identify where you are in that photo and how to get there. So you have to 
read the gra- the signs on the ground to do that. Hmm. That's where the skill comes in, as far as our photos are concerned. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So that that was the uh, summer job then, and what would you were you then back in the fall of forty one, uh, starting up grad yeah. school or what? Uh, well, the uh, the dean of uh, forestry at, at Colorado A and M had uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, arranged a uh, teaching assistantship for me for graduate study at Syracuse University. Oh. And so I went back there uh, when we finished that summer's work to start, and this is fall of 41, to uh, start uh, graduate study, and I did. And I was going to work on deer. I was going to work on censusing white-tailed deer. And uh, just got well started on it, got my coursework underway, and was working as a graduate assistant, which means I assisted in the labs and in the lectures and stuff. And then came December 7th, 1941. Wow. And I was in the graduate office in the uh, one of the forestry buildings at Syracuse University when I heard the president's famous Day of Infamy speech. And we knew the world was changing and so was our lives. Hmm. And so I was able to stick with it until March and it became evident that I had to go in so I did. I, I just uh, resigned from my job of teaching and, and uh, went to my home in Seattle to wait just a couple, week or two before I was called in in Fort Collins, or where I was registered for the draft. That's where I entered this service. And, and then how long after you got your draft notice then before you, you shipped off to uh, basic training? Well. Uh, I don't remember how long, it wasn't very long before I had to report. And so I reported in Fort Collins, went in a bus with others to, uh, to Fort Logan. That's where I went and entered the service. Got your uniforms and all that kind of stuff. And, <clears throat> and then uh, went to Shepherd Field in Texas for four weeks of basic training. And, and how, was that, how was that transition going from uh, civilian life and the military life. Was that much of a transition for you? or wasn't much of a transmission for me because, see, I'd been used to living in the wilds and uh, in uh, unusual situations. So you uh, kind of had a, an edge over the rest of the guys then, I would imagine. Well, yeah. maybe so. I yeah. don't know. It, yeah. it, it certainly wasn't uh, very traumatic for me, though. Okay. And, uh, uh, but uh, the, and it wasn't very, it wasn't very, it wasn't what I would call very rigorous basic training. It wasn't anything like I think Marines would do or anything like that. Mostly learning discipline and marching and stuff like that. And I was assigned though to a, because of that, my experience with our photos, I was assigned to a, 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 it was the headquarters company of the 8th Air Force, which became the 8th Air Force in England. And we were, and it was, uh, I was with the, uh, the air photography part of that, and when I, I reported to uh, Camp Dietrich, Maryland, this is right after Shepherd Field, and uh, uh, the first, when I walked in, the, the officer that was there, was, and I was uh, just a private, uh, uh, showed me a photo, and uh, air photo, and I said, I looked at it and I said, gosh, that looks like a aquatic tank. Well, the reason I did it, you could tell a tank shape, even though it was just a small tank, and there was obvious water waves there. Well, my air photo interpretation experience, he showed, he, he said, well, let me check that out. <laughs> so he said, oh yeah, that's what it is. I was on my way up. <laughs> okay. In fact, I made, sorry, uh, Corporal, without ever being a PFC, because I was on the line to be uh, the, the uh, master sergeant <laughs> in that in that outfit that was going to be in the Eighth Air Force headquarters in in uh, England, uh, which uh, which didn't work out, Brad. Because, oh, huh. and, and this I see the other part of my life in this. You know, I've told you about the natural truth and the supernatural truth. 
I see supernatural truth in this. Because there at uh, Cap uh, Dietrich, I, uh, we went out on a march and were exposed and, and I caught a bad cold and I was put up in sort of an infirmary but there was no nurse there or anything and, and, uh, and I, I just sort of, I caught pneumonia. Oh. Well, it got bad enough by that time that they sent me to Camp Meade, Maryland, for a, to the hospital and my outfit left without me. And I didn't ever catch up with them. Hmm. But think of what would have happened if I'd have gone. I'd have never, well, you'll hear the rest of the story, but it's, I would never have married who I married. Yeah, right, yeah, wow. I would never have had the life I had if I hadn't done that. So anyway, they reassigned me to, uh, to Dover Air Force Base, which was a, was a submarine chasing place with B-26s. And I was in the office. That's the only thing they could figure to do with me is to help me file papers and stuff like that. And so, but then I applied to be an, an, an air cadet in a, in a photo lab interpret photo lab commander. Went to Boca Raton, Florida. Boy, that's good duty in midwinter. And <clears throat> there we. Uh, uh, did basic training for uh, as an air as a cadet, Air Force cadet, and and then uh, from there I forget how long that was, but there's a lot of marching and stuff there, and, and then uh, went to Yale for uh, for the uh, school for wow. the Air Force Air uh, for the uh, photo lab commander school. We lived in uh, in the dormitory rooms and the quadrangles for the head at Yale and met in the classrooms and ate in the dining room and that was uh, the experience there was something else. I was on duty one time on uh, guard duty outside a quadrangle where the entrance comes out and uh, <clears throat> close as I am to you, Glenn Miller showed up. <laughs> Captain Glenn Miller, with two or three guys, I don't know who they were, was in his band. His band was in forming and training there to go overseas. Wow. And so not only did I get a chance to salute Glenn Miller face to face, but they played at noon for the mess hall. Can you imagine uh -huh. having a mess hall in that service? And the one, the, the one I remember most of all was uh, 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 Tony Martin singing that old black magic with the Glenn Miller band. That's now one of the classics when you, when you get a Glenn Miller album anymore, you almost always get that one with, with Tony Martin singing wow. that song. Did you ever get a chance to talk to him and, and no. share your common connection of Fort Morgan? Uh, no, yeah. no, that's right. That yeah. was a connection I didn't even know then. But yeah. No, I didn't. But if I had if I'd have known that at that time, I might have bugged him a little bit, even though here I was just a cadet. Yeah, but sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a, <laughs> what an experience. Yeah, that was interesting. Huh. From there, though, there again, this supernatural, God's, uh, that's God's uh, direction. I see a lot of it in my life. From there was a sign, and partly because of the Forest Service map, a photo mapping experience to come to Lowry Field in, Fort, in Denver to, to, in a photogrammetry school. It was a photo mapping school, learning how to make maps from air photos. Wow. And they had the school was at Lowry Field. I was assigned there, and by that time I, I had my commission was a lieutenant. <clears throat> I went home on leave just briefly uh, into Seattle. Now, well, your folks had moved up to Seattle My then? My folks had moved to Seattle okay. by that time from Denver. My dad had a pastor. Okay. And <clears throat> my mother had met a young lady uh, when I was uh, cruising timber that summer. They came out and we met a young lady that I uh, knew in Denver. And she went to church with us in Denver and knew, met my folks, and so they knew her. And 
They just happened in between that time to be on West Colfax and recognized her in a restaurant. And renewed acquaintances. Uh -huh. Best of all, got her phone number. So when I was at home on leave, they got her phone number in Denver. And here I was stationed in Denver now. So I had a phone number. <laughs> And that led to 72 years of marriage. Wow. <laughs> wow wonderful. Wonderful. So that, anyway, uh, so I was uh, going to school, and that was a pretty easy school. It started at noon and ended at 5. So I was free to party all night. <laughs> I didn't, though, really. But I did date that beautiful brunette. She was working at... Uh, Remington Arms, inspecting 50, 30 caliber cartridges to see the primers were in all, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so we got to know each other pretty well, and uh, she finally said yes at near the end of the summer. It was on October 1st, 1943. She said yes, but we uh, <clears throat> weren't figured not do anything until after the four. So uh, we'd be married. We'd be married six months after the four, maybe. And, and, uh, it didn't work out quite that way. Though it was better than that, but better, not better. <laughs> so uh, anyway, then from there I went to. Uh, I don't know why. I the army was pretty good, uh, and this was Air Force really. Yeah. But it wasn't. It wasn't Air Corps yet. It wasn't Air Force yet. It was Air right. Corps. Right. Right. And uh, they were pretty good at, at getting taking advantage of what your knowledge and experience was. And they didn't, uh, so uh, they apparently didn't have a need right then for people mapping, photo mapping. They sent me to Air Intelligence School at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And there we learned to uh, measure things on photos like uh, length of railroad tracks and, and identify trains and you know, identify from air photos damage, d uh, bomb damage, and features to, to bomb and that kind of stuff. Air, it, it was air photo intelligence. Mm. And uh, so I learned to do that. And uh, uh, and then I was assigned to uh, Will Rogers Field in uh, Oklahoma. And, and, and I was in a photo interpreter's company there, which is all officers, it was all officers, uh, photo interpreters. Uh, but I still like mapping. And there was there a uh, an engineer company, or a battalion really forming. It was within the Corps of Engineers, but it was assigned to the Air Force to do mapping. And they let me transfer from the, from the Air, Air Corps to the Corps of Engineers in, the, in a photo mapping battalion that, was, that would produce maps and print them and they, they do the whole business mobily. Hmm. And that was, they were scheduled to go overseas right soon though. And, uh, and <coughs> so <coughs> I was hoping we'd be married but things are dimming. Chances look pretty slim. <laughs> but it was Christmas Eve, 1943, and and I was going to call and w wish my the gal I was introduced to, Marianne Town was her name. <clears throat> Merry Christmas, and see if I if there's any last chance. <laughs> <clears throat> so I called her, and and I just. I could sense there was a little something different in her tones. And I thought, oh, no, not a dear John mm. letter. So, but I started out anyway. I was going to start out, why not? And I just got about that far, and she says, come out to Seattle for the wedding. Can you imagine that? Wow. Huh. <laughs> well... <laughs> Naturally, I want to sell. They gave me a special leave. 
to go out, even though I was scheduled to go overseas, especially. So we were married on January 19th, 1944. My dad did it because it was in my dad's oh, right. church okay. in, in Seattle. <laughs> but they had to arrange all that stuff while I was gone. I, anyway, we, we did that. And so then we had a honeymoon train trip on the way back to Oklahoma. And 18 days in heaven in Oklahoma <laughs> before we took off for Europe. Oh, <laughs> that must have been tough leaving her behind. <laughs> For two and a half years. Two and, a, two and a half years, oh boy. <laughs> With uncertainty, what what was ahead of you, I would imagine. <clears throat> what was ahead of me? Well, we... we well, I mean, the uncertainty, not only of leaving oh, her, but, yeah. but the un, uh, leaving into uncertainty, really, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Oh, uh, <laughs> not knowing whether I'd ever come back. Right, See, exactly. That's a, look, a lot of faith. Right. That's another important thing, I think, in this. The home front was a was an extremely important part of, of World War II. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The fact that I had a wife back here that, was, that I knew that was a, a wonderful woman, uh, and I was be back with her someday, and uh, writing and thinking of and you know, talking to, uh, and uh, not, not to mention the fact that she was working too, which meant she was helping to carry the, the load on the home front. Right. So, uh, and I also, incidentally, had a cousin who was almost my same age, just eight days older, in Fort Morgan, who was a farmer. He he stayed as a farmer. They needed him more as a farmer by far than he did me as a sure. the, the mapper. Right. And and so uh, he 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 did that. And I, I, the home front was a really important thing. Anyway, we went. To, we we did ship out right soon, and we're on a New Z Zealand ship. Where did you depart from? From New York. Yeah, and, and that's always uh, always begs the question. Here's a landlocked boy from Colorado yeah. going to sea. <laughs> First you time your, in the ocean. Did yeah. you get your sea legs right? Talk about that trip because those those trips are pretty amazing Surprisingly, too. Surprisingly, I didn't get very yeah. sick. I didn't get sick, but I I, I I'm I'm prone to air or, or seasickness, but I didn't get it on that. It was a <laughs> And it's a wonder I didn't because this was on a, a New Zealand uh, uh, freighter. Well, it was maybe more than a freighter. They had a lot of staterooms, and we had a stateroom, and there was two, I think there was two of us in, in, in the stateroom. We weren't below decks. We were up on, a, up on the upper decks. But I will remember they had a steward that brought you stuff for breakfast, or just before breakfast. And that was... Uh, the thing you would bring is a great big uh, pot, ceramic pot with a handle, of course, a big cup is what it was, full of tea, because that's, you know, New Zealand, with milk in it. And that was breakfast. <laughs> and I could drink it, and, and it was okay. Other guys couldn't. There was, that, that makes you seasick, but I didn't. But anyway, that's, that's where we got over to... England. Now, were you in a convoy or were you by yourself? Oh, yeah, we were in a convoy. Okay. And any worries along the way of uh, German yeah. subs or? Yeah. There was there, there was a few alerts and uh, zigzagging and and uh, but no no bad uh, no bad uh, oh good no bad sinkings that I know of in our convoy. But uh, yeah, we landed. I don't know where we landed in England, but uh, we went to. Uh, and this was the 942nd Engineer Topographic Battalion, was the name of the battalion, a, a Corps of Engineers Battalion attached to the 8th Air Force Headquarters in England. And so we were due to go to the 8th Air Force Headquarters, which is at High Wycombe, England, about 30 miles northwest of, Fort, of uh, London. But, uh, of London. but uh, it was... Uh, they weren't quite ready for us yet because uh, I guess they, they were putting in some quonsets and stuff like that. But so they put us up in civilian accommodations at Kew Gardens. And we stayed with the elderly uh, English couple, ladies, two ladies that were, that was very interesting, their contact with them because we had C rations and K rations. And they especially like, and we shared with those ladies. Mm -hmm. 
and they especially like the sea ration. They couldn't imagine these rich Americans with this wonderful food. And here <laughs> they were living right on yeah. the edge. Yeah, right. But uh, we were there about a week or two, I think, before we got into our our Quonset. We were in a Quonset. I was in a Quonset with six guys on the uh, on the grounds of a girls' school, which is uh, in in High Wycombe. It was taken over, and the girls' school itself was taken over as a headquarters for the Eighth Air Force headquarters, General Doolittle, and that. Yeah, book. right. Uh huh. And we lived up on a hill in a Quonset and, uh, uh, and then worked. And we were in a, a mobile, uh, it was a mobile uh, map making thing with the uh, uh, with six by sixes, the uh, big trucks, mm -hmm. big army trucks, mm -hmm. six by sixes, and vans. And things were mounted right in the vans. So they were completely mobile. Mm -hmm. We weren't mobile because we didn't have to be. Yeah. Backed up to a dock instead of Jiffy made dock. A, well, not really Jiffy made, just a wooden dock. Right at, we could see the head, head horse headquarters building right stone's throw away from where we were. And, and the, backed all these vans up to the dock and there was a camera van and there was a uh, plate making van to make the the photographic plates. This is offset lithography, which makes a takes a big twenty two by twenty nine inch plate grained and with a with a coating that has an image on it that huh. takes ink and transfers it to the to the paper and uh, uh, and uh, had a press several press vans and a graining van to reprocess the plates and a makeup van which would where artists uh, made the maps and put stuff together and you can see how wow the, uh. and then we had inside too an inside building which made it a lot easier but as well as those outside now what was your your job in that in that line in that whole uh, method of uh, well, it was mostly just to sort of keeping things going and because uh, I was a uh, uh, we they again America was, a, was especially good at getting people in the right spot. We had pressmen that were experts that mm. were, you know, in civilian life. Mm -hmm. And the cameramen that were expert photographers. And uh, uh, draftsmen. They, these guys didn't just learn it all of a sudden. They were experts. All we had to do was help organize and make things flow. And so I had an office uh, that was, uh, and I was on quite a bit on swing shift. Uh, and it traded off with other guys. And we were there just to sort of troubleshoot and keep things moving. And uh, uh, another job though was interesting was censoring mail. Oh, right. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well. They, uh, it was required that in order to, uh, for mail to pass, it had to be signed by an, an officer that was a, that was a reviewer. And so, uh, so I could do that and I did it. And the guys then would come on in the evening shift and they'd bring me the, all the stuff that they wanted me to, <laughs> and I would, uh, I would review it and censored if it needed, cut stuff out with a razor blade if I had to, to keep secret figures, facts and figures and places and <coughs> times and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And and then I'd sign up and seal it, sign it and seal it. And I, I knew that those I knew that those guys so well because of those letters. Ah, oh, right. They're writing yeah. to their wives yeah. or their girlfriends or their families and and uh, it was a, a tremendous experience, really. But uh, and 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 this day, in this day and age, I mean, with computers and cell phones and such, you were only limited to to your V mail or your mail, right? Uh, <laughs> That's right. A lot yeah. of it was V mail, as yeah. you know. It was done by photograph. Yeah. They photographed it and sent Which, it by a air. But uh, another interesting thing I did, and I don't think this was violating my trust, but I wanted to tell my wife where I was. <laughs> and so 
I'll confess now since the statute of <laughs> limitations is over <laughs> that what I did is for a while I start each letter with with the first letter of spelling out the name Hi Wickham. Okay. <laughs> and back well, she wasn't long before she caught on. It must something was going on, and then she every letter she'd be looking for the rest of that letter, and uh, of course she never shared that with anybody. But yeah. uh, but uh, anyway, that uh, that was my way of helping her to feel a little more where I was, sure. what was happening. Sure, yeah, and, I, and I'm sure in the reverse, you look forward to her letters uh, <laughs> coming, coming, uh, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, course, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, been over there where you were, did you ever run into your old unit that you sh would have shipped out with before no, you got sick? No, I never, never did. No? Oh, okay. No, I, I don't know what happened to them. I, I never did even look into that, really. But they must have been there at that same place because that's what they were organized right? to do. Yeah. It was the cadre that was forming at, at Camp Dietrich. Cadre is an initial group of soldiers and officers and enlisted men that will eventually be the leaders of the group. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming the whole process was uh, uh, you would send out reconnaissance to, to photograph over your or wherever they bring it back and then you would you would manipulate it into a map? Uh, well it was not only that it was it was it was maps yes it could be where air photos would take a photo and then they'd bring it in and, and uh, draftsmen would convert it to a map and then we'd print it that was part of it, but that wasn't the biggest part as it turned out. The biggest part was printing informational information. And one that I remember especially was a big, we had a, we had two sides of press, a 22, 20, 29 Webendorf, and we had a 20 by 22, I uh, forget what the name of that was, uh, press. But it was, uh, in that one of the small presses, they made a, it was a big one page with a big picture of a jet airplane. Huh. The first jet airplane that the, that the Germans had, a picture of it and its characteristics, how fast it could fly, how fast it could turn, how long it was, and uh, all that stuff. And, uh, and that was printed out to send to all the uh, Air Force bases. Wow, holy cow. So there's a good example. Uh, yeah. But it was also informational type stuff, booklets and Okay. That okay. Was just, so it's all kinds of printing we did. It wasn't just okay. mapping. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did you get uh, time, furloughs and such, to go into London? and? Yes, and, we got the... leaves and went to London and uh, 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 bought. One of, the not, one of the good things in London was we could found things we could buy and send as gifts home. Ah. And I bought a beautiful rose beautiful sort of a glove box with uh, inlaid uh, wood and stuff beautiful thing at Harrods in London huh. sent it to Marion and uh, wow. yeah we did that we also could go down on the Thames Henley on the Thames I think was the name where it was sort of a tea room and a little garden you could sit in didn't feel like the war oh really so you weren't caught up in the, any of the uh, the bombings or the well uh, the, that the, was uh, another part of it but it, at least that time we were sitting at that little table with the Thames nearby and, and drinking tea. It sure didn't seem like oh, wow. the war. But uh, yeah, the times it did seem like the war was uh, in uh, uh, the buzz bombs. Buzz, okay. And uh, that's, uh, with, among the tents that the, many of the troops were living in and the Quonsets that we were living in, amidst them there would be little revetments which was uh, uh, walls that were built up, I think, with uh, cinder block and some and soil, about uh, four feet high. Open top. If it was a direct hit, no way you could slide anyway. But if it was a blast out here, it would protect you if you were inside. So if when you heard it, put 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 put, that was a buzz bomb, and it was a it was it was a. Uh, Rocket, well, not really a rocket, I guess. Engine-driven, uh, man, uh, manless aircraft, short wings, but mostly bomb. Come flying over with, uh, 
and what they had it timed to to either the fuel run out or I don't know what how they timed it, but then it would go in and that would drop wherever. And its purpose was not strategic bombing; its purpose was psychological bombing. Right, right. And uh, <coughs> it was uh, <coughs> so we, once in a while we'd be have to go out and temporarily get in those things until the pop, 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 and went by. That's why I always understood that you're okay as long as you can hear it pet, pet, petting, but it, it's when it went silent is when you got <laughs> then the, duck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course, that was true of the uh, the uh, V2 bomb, which is a, which was a uh, intercontinental ballistic mm -hmm. rocket missile. Really, it was, a, it was a rocket that was fired in an arc and came over. And, uh, and uh, there was all kinds of rumors about what it was like because there was a lot of I remember they would say that there is a lot of, uh, of uh, dry ice associated with the, where the bomb hit. So I don't know what that was. But hmm. Anyway, it, it hit in London. So I was in London a couple of times when the air raid siren would go off, either because of bombers or because they sensed a, a IBM, ICBM coming in. And we'd be in an aircraft shelter with with the civilians in mm, wow. you know, underground in uh, London. Mm. Those are the times you really felt you were in a war. Yeah, right, sure. And then, of course, D-Day, that was, oh, Brad, that was, I, uh, the sky was so full of airplanes, you could hardly see this sky. Wow. Oh, that must have been a sight. Well, every kind of airplane you can imagine, yeah. bombers and yeah. uh, glider, uh, Planes and it, 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 I tell you that was a fantastic. Now, could sight. you, uh, in your position, could you sense that something was coming? Up? Did your workload increase? Uh, to did you help uh, did prepare for that at all? Did, you were aware of? Uh, that, well, uh, not 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 nearly specifically, but in general, we knew it was going to come. Yeah, logically, it would come in the early summer or late spring because that's the best time to do it. It was, it was well managed, obviously present. Or, General Eisenhower knew what he was about, and so, uh, and then, uh, but then came VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Now, uh, thing in my memory there is that I was in London with a friend. I forget who it was. I think it was probably Skip. Uh, anyway, he, uh, we were walking down the street, and this English couple was there, and. You, you know, we we did well with the English. We got well, very well, well with them, and enjoyed the, talking with them, stuff like that. But it was, uh, they weren't very naturally, uh, very uh, you know effusive. Mm -hmm. But this couple said, "Yeah," and there's a couple of the guys that helped us do it. That was interesting for two reasons. One was see, to them, and that was okay. They were the ones that did it. We helped. Of course, we didn't see it that way. Yeah, right. We thought we were the ones that were by far the most doing. But anyway, that that was interesting. And that's that's how you uh, yeah. that's how you found out about VE Day or oh or no, we or knew. VE Day. Oh, but they, they just, just didn't tell and celebrate. Yeah, yeah. They were celebrating. Yeah. And, they, and they made that remark so that we wow. would recognize that they recognized us. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. So uh, uh, the entire war that you spent in England, you, you didn't move over over to the continent. Yes, I did. Then oh, you after, did. Oh. After the war was over, then they moved. I, I never did know whether, in a way, I guess we were part of the occupation. I don't okay. really know. Uh -huh. uh, partly it was because it was a problem how to get everybody back because it was all by ship. Yeah. But yes, we went about. I'd say. Uh, I don't remember the exact timing. Probably four or five months, maybe after the VE day, uh, we knew we were going to go. The unit was going to go to, uh, well, not all the unit, just part of the unit was going to go to uh, Germany. And so we they took the mobile vans. That, then we did use them. Huh. We did use uh -huh. the mobile vans, plus all the other stuff like jeeps and stuff that it takes to move troops. And we moved uh, into, we went, we went across the channel and through 
France and into Germany. And we went to Eschwege, which is a little town uh, east of, uh, of uh, uh, I forgot the name of the town, uh, northern Germany, east of... Uh, like Hamburg or... Um... No, it wasn't, it was a little bit further south of that. It was, uh, anyway, that it was right on the border with the, the Russian zone. Oh, wow. Oh. And there was a river there, and the Russians were over there. We could see the Russian patrolling over there. We were on this side. And it was a, uh, it was a Luftwaffe training field we were in. So it was a sort of their Air Force uh -huh. facilities, uh -huh. and they were using them now. And, uh, so we were there for a while, and then, then we moved to uh, Schlangenbad, which means snake bath. It's a resort area on the Rhine near Fra near Wiesbaden, near Frankfurt. And we, there we set up in sheds. There they had, for the, the old guest sheds, the guest garages, we just backed the, uh, the, the vans up to them. And then we had the garages themselves to use for operations inside. And we, we did a bunch of printing, all kinds you can imagine for, for them. So we were operating as uh -huh. we were right, actually right. planning to do it and lived in a nice place, nice Roselle Hotel. Oh, wow. Now with your, your German ancestry, did you, did you speak <laughs> any German? I didn't speak any German. That's the thing you see, you always regret. I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. My grandparents could yeah. and they would have right. loved to teach me, but I right. didn't right. Know No, I couldn't. And that was too bad because I one time remember going with a friend of mine. I forget what she went he was. But anyway, he had, he was out amongst better than I was. He got acquainted with people. He got acquainted with some Germans, and so I went with him. It was a little uh, in the north of Schlangenbad, but it was a farm area and a farmhouse, typical farmhouse. And they were hospitable, but I don't forget what we had, but but they had, there were some sort of middle-aged ladies there and an old guy. <coughs> and he started singing something. And I don't know what it was, but he was singing with gusto and with feeling. And the ladies that made him worry, <laughs> they, they didn't know we might hear it. I, I don't know what he was singing, but I'm pretty sure it was a German nationalistic, uh, maybe even a Nazi song. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> but it made them, made his, their daughters or whoever they were very nervous. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Can I back up and ask you, uh, when you guys crossed over the channel and, and then drove across France to Germany, can you describe the scene, what you were seeing there? Was there still a, a lot of war damage and, and, uh, yeah, well, yeah, there was a lot of bomb damage, yeah. and uh, uh, every place you went was bomb damage. They, and uh, especially in the hedgerows, you know, maybe you've heard about those, mm -hmm. the hedgerows where there's, they were protective things in, in a way because they were, so they were blasted out of there. And so there was a lot of blasting along the side. Of it. So that's what my memory was. And, and we went through this one town, and I forget the name of it, but it was just completely rubble. Mm. There was a remarkable comeback in Germany. Yeah. I tell you that yeah. from, what, from what we saw there. A lot worse in Germany than it was in France. Yeah. Because of course we didn't bomb France. Right, right, right. Yeah. We did go back to, uh, I did get a chance to go back into Paris with a, oh. with a courier flight. They had courier flights from Eschwege every day carry mail back and forth and you could go back and get leave and go and see it uh, get go and see it the show on the stage and so I did that once oh that wonderful was, yeah that was yeah. wonderful yeah. Yeah. so you remained in Germany until you'd built up enough points to come home then or uh, what finally brought you back home I remained in Germany until there's enough points and I guess the points are related to what capacity they have and what they need they had for you there one of the interesting things though in that uh, uh, and that uh, setup we had with those sheds and the, the vans backed up to them. We had in, we had our cutting, you know, we had a big cutter, a paper cutter, big one, because that we're talking about 22 by 29 inch sheets of paper, and you trim them off, you know. And so you get things that are maybe six inches wide and maybe 22 inches long. And so the local German schoolmaster found out about that. 
that. So he came up with two kids, I well remember, and a wagon to get all the paper he could get from us because that's where they, 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 the need for paper, that's where they got their paper. Uh, wow. So we had pretty good relationship, really, with the, the Durham people on the left and everything. Anybody I talked to was, uh, was friendly, except that one guy. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Now, was there any, any ever any talk of, because, uh, you know, after VE Day, you know, the war was still raging in the Pacific. Yeah, that's right. Was there any uh, talk of your unit being transferred to the Pacific? Or? No, there wasn't, and I don't know why, and uh, we actually came back not as a unit. Oh, really? We did go to, to uh, Germany as a unit, or part of a unit. That it wasn't the whole company. It was mostly the, the presses, not so much the drafting. I don't know why that was. I guess they figured, they figured they'd get the copy. They didn't need draftsmen, what they, because they were using a lot of words, and you know, you still have to do is copy that. So I guess that's the reason. But anyway, no, we came back as individuals. I came back on a ship with a variety of people from, from a variety of, uh, of outfits. Okay. Yeah, came back to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Was discharge center, which is interesting, because that's exactly where my grandfather, my maternal grand great grandfather, the gold miner from California, he was a, so he was a Civil War veteran. Wow! And he ended up in the soldiers' place in Fort Leavenworth, and he's buried there. Uh. And I haven't, but my son has seen his tombstone. There. Wow! Uh. So I was discharged there and took the train to Denver, and uh, oh, but that was a wonderful homecoming. Oh, what a wonderful homecoming! And and Marianne came in from she'd been living out in uh, Bremerton, Washington, and so Marianne came down on uh, uh, by train, and I met her at the train in Union Station in Denver. Oh. So then we began the wonderful life of after two and a half years, <laughs> we began a oh. wonderful life of. Uh, of marriage after uh, for the next 72 years now. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, well, now we've uh, we've got you out, out of the service. Take your story from there, now that you're back. Well, we, uh, we did have to, uh, uh, I want to go back one thing. Okay, yeah, please do, yes. Uh, uh, after Marion said yes, uh, I want to get our diamond ring. I could not afford it. So I went, I took, caught a bus to Boulder. I remember that, I was at Lowry Field. Caught a bus to Boulder, where my Uncle George, the one that I caught the uh -huh. cutthroat with, uh, and his wife, Leona, lived, and I borrowed $100 from him to buy a uh, wedding ring, <laughs> diamond wedding ring, for $100. <laughs> at a jeweler that I knew in Denver, because I knew him from when we had a church there. His name was uh, Mulberg, J.R. Mulberg. And uh, I guess I got a ring for her and, and gave it to her. And uh, uh, But the reason I raise that is, after the war, he was a guy with the best connections, and so he got me a car. He was able to put me in touch with a car salesman I could trust, and we bought a 41 Ford V8. <laughs> Used car, of course, <laughs> and uh, huh. wow, yeah, traveled to our traveled to uh, Seattle, and we spent some time there and worked uh, on my own a little bit. And uh, and I was going back to Syracuse to continue my graduate work, so then we drove to Syracuse, and and uh, and that time we were in the Adirondacks. Uh, by that time, I was doing research on, de on the deer, and the boy, they were good to me. Uh, they ha had a cabin there. That was one of the cabins. Uh huh. Another cabin. Uh huh. And uh, uh, we lived over winter, and I trapped deer, live trapped deer, and we ran a deer drive with probably 30 or 40 people, the students they brought up from the campus, to uh, drive through the the. Uh, Northern hardwood forest and and count the deer that came out. And uh -huh. So we know how many there were there, see. 
So then I could use the other signs like like uh, uh, like antler scrapes or pellet groups or or sightings of deer that related to a known population. So that so that was wonderful uh, there. And then then comes the next stage, which is uh, again the Lord was definitely in this. Uh, my uh, my major professor, which was uh, Ralph T. King, Terry King, who was uh, one of the very first pioneers right along with Aldo Leopold in wildlife biology. He had done his work at, at Minnesota on grouse, rough grouse, and is well known all over. And he was my major professor and the head of the department at, at Syracuse. He, he went to the uh, Midwinter Wildlife Conference in, in, Arizona, in uh, Texas. Uh, March, actually, uh, they have an annual meeting of all wild Africans in the country, and that was in March. He went there. He just happened to sit at a table at the banquet with the head of the wildlife department at the Colorado a and J.V. K. Wager. Wager building is named for him in Fort Tim, Kansas. Just happened to sit together. So he came back and told me, there's an opening in wildlife in Colorado. Wow. <laughs> uh, you better apply. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> the reason it was an opening, they'd hired a guy that, they, that uh, took a year's leave and went to Africa to photograph elephants. And got so interested, he wanted another new year. They said, "Well, oh, we can't stand that. We're going to hire somebody." But it was only actually for a year, possibly. <laughs> so they had a one-year appointment. But uh, so then I, I, oh, I had, I take a civil service test, and so I was stood high because partly I got a five-point veterans preference on civil service. So I was stood high on the civil service registers, the federal. So I had a job offer from from uh, Florida for Fish and Wildlife Service. Just about ready to take it. Applied to CSU, got the job. Wow. <laughs> Passed up to Florida, went to Colorado. Huh. <laughs> That's how I got started here <laughs> at CSU, and this was 1947. And. Uh, there was a one man, there was a two man department. J.V.K. Waker taught outdoor recreation. I taught wildlife biology. And then it developed from there on. Uh, so did you help develop that, uh, yes, that department? Yes, and and yeah, taught lots of different courses. Uh, and I, did, I, I don't know, like, well, you, you never know when you look back whether you could have made a mistake or not. There really seem to be two kinds of career paths. One kind is you get better and better at one little thing. That means you spend all your time on it and you only teach that course and you only do research on that subject and you get better and better and you know more and more and more and you become the expert. That's one route. The other route is you take the general thing and say all the kinds of possible things there are that students need to know and I, I went that route, and and so uh, I taught lots of different courses. La uh, whenever I saw the need for a different kind of information, I taught that. Huh. And so, uh, uh, so and then gradually there were more and more students, and so we began to have more staff. So we added a lot of staff by the time I left. Left in 1974. Uh, there was about four or five other people on the wildlife staff alone. And, uh, uh. But uh, uh, so, so then I moved to, uh, so then a job came up in Southwest Colorado. Uh, it was for the Southwest Regional dir uh, dr uh, uh, Director for Colorado State University. 13 counties down there, uh, all CSU activities including extension, you know, county agents, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. including experiment stations, including relationships with other colleges, 
all that kind of stuff. And, and I applied for it and I got that job. So then I moved out of teaching into uh, administration and then spent my time dealing with the wildlife people in those, but not wildlife, CSU people, by that time CSU, agriculture and, and forestry, oh, state forest service, what's that name? And uh, experiment stations. Hmm. Uh, and so that's what I spent the last seven years. And then we retired in Durango and spent 34 years in Durango before we came here. How many years combined did, were you in your career then? Well, actually, uh, actually uh, on the job, 34 years at CSU. <laughs> Twenty-seven on campus and seven down in Durango, and uh, then I retired. So I've been retired since nineteen eighty-one. Hmm. Wow. And uh, I enjoyed it. I, I didn't always do things right, Brad. I, I sometimes probably spent more. Thing on my job than on a family. Oh, really? Okay. And part of that was we had spring trips. And we did that because we wanted the seniors to see what it was really like out there in the real world. So we took this wildlife seniors and recreation too on a trip around the state. And so I just, I alone organized and did those things four weeks to six weeks. Wow. Uh -huh. And I was gone. I just left Marion with our two sons, and uh, and, and that also happened when I went to back to finish my PhD at uh, Syracuse in 19, uh, 1976. Let's see, was that right? Yeah, seventy six. Uh, left her alone for the whole fall, and uh, and, her, and, her, and the result was. Uh, one of our sons once remarked to my wife, uh, Dad really is married to his job, isn't he? Hmm. Well, that, uh, as well, that was very common with your generation, I would think, as well. But uh, don't you think? In uh, some ways it was, yes. Uh, in some ways it was. And it's true that I wouldn't have done some, been able to do some of the things that I have done. Uh, if I hadn't have put that kind of effort into it, but it, I'm, but it still makes you wonder, and it makes you realize. And there, anybody that, that hears about this needs to think twice. Uh, I did. I did. I acted a lot. I acted a lot more instinctively than I did analytically. Mm -hmm. That this is what you're supposed to do. Do it. Mm -hmm. Not. What's the best way to do this, and why I do it, and that's that's a different way, and I didn't do that as much as I should have probably. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, here's about this. It's, there's a thing. If you're a young starter, watch out. Think about what you're doing and why, and yeah. instead of just thinking you got to do the job. And, hmm. Well, that kind of leads into the next question. Talk a little bit about family, marrying the kids, grandkids, uh, and such. We have a wonderful family. Uh, we've, uh, we had two sons. We have two sons. Uh, they both now just recently retired. That's the age group we're in. And one of them worked for Terry, the oldest one, uh, worked for uh, uh, Mark Marietta originally and became Lockheed Martin. And he, uh, he was a, uh, he went to CSU in mathematics and, and uh, computer, just at the time oh, computers my. were coming in, back when they were using Hollerith cards and doing your own programming and all that stuff. And he became good at it and very early. And in fact, they hired him to program a lot of the student aid stuff in the, in the, in the student mm. aid office at CSU because he was that good at, at it. So he was hired by Lockheed Martin and they sent him to school in, uh, in, uh, 
in uh, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, BC, because there was a guy there that taught the type of course that they needed for the kind of mathematical things he'd need to predict trajectories of bit missiles and rocket inter interbelt missiles and and satellites and all that stuff. That's what he did. He became a, the uh, one of the basic programmers for that, and, uh, which included both mathematics and, and computer. But anyway, that's where he met his wife. And wonderful, wonderful lady, Jenny. You do love her, and uh, they have they have uh, six, four kids, and uh, four kids now have begin to have kids. We now have, let's see, from that family we have. Uh, three, four, we have four, four great-grandkids, great. plus some foster kids that they're taking care of. That's another thing, you know. I want to emphasize uh, two things. One is the uh, importance of the home front during the war. We already talked about mm -hmm. that. But also about uh, the place of God in our lives. And I don't know how this fits with what your objectives yeah. are and what, and what the rest of the, uh, uh, what others think, but God is an, and Jesus Christ are a very important forces in our lives, and in fact, we think of it this way, and this is strictly biblical. Incidentally, I can, I have an article. I've written the search for truth, and that's where one th one of the things I talk about is what I just talked about the, the natural truth, mm -hmm. supernatural truth. But in that also, that that if you if you say, let's take the Big Bang theory, which is what some physical scientists now think must be the way it happened. It seems just, ca well, it's logical because what they do is trace back from the fact that we have an expanding universe back to the time when it was an extremely dense, energetic uh, mass of, of uh, well, the, the thing is, where'd that come from? Right. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the only answer I can come up with, and the most logical answer, and it's so logical, there was a creator somewhere. Well, if you start with that, once you begin to say there's a creator, then you say, well, which one? Who is it? And then you look for the, play, the evidence. And one evidence is the Bible, which claims to be the creator, and which also tells a lot of other information and has a lot of, uh, of credibility because of its long standing and its selection. Well, anyway, that's a way of saying that's where my faith is based. Mm -hmm. But in that Bible, it says that God's mind and spirit are in us, if we will let them be. And I think of it this way. I have a soul, and that soul, the best evidence I have for a soul, I think, is... Super uh, is uh, out of uh, near death experiences. People that have experienced death, experience of floating, where they look down and see things and can describe their family and the doctors and their own body down there. They can describe it as though they were up above, and that, that then they travel on to a beautiful light tunnel and. They get into a beautiful place and they even recognize people. There, that, that's a something, something does that. I think it's a soul. So I think there is a soul. That's, that's supernatural truth. And if that soul contains mind and spirit, that's, scripture says that. And, and it also says God's mind and spirit can be in us and communicating with our mind and spirit. And I think that's what happened. And that's my goal, is to so yield my mind and spirit to God's mind and spirit that I do, I completely do what 
God wants me to do. And I've seen it happen in the past, as I said several times. Yeah. God's hand has been in my life. And praise the Lord, I love him. And I, um, I just want everybody to know the joy there is in knowing. And it's so simple. All you have to do is say, I believe. Yeah. Just, well, anyway, that's a, is that a rabbit track? Or? No, that was a, that was a, that's learning more about you. That's fascinating stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> now you talked a little bit about Terry. Talk about a little bit about your other son. Okay, the other, oh yeah, okay, that's Terry. But now the other son is uh, uh, David, uh, and uh, he's uh, uh, he's four years younger, and he uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he uh, he sort of followed a lot of the wildlife. Not wildlife, but wild land stuff. He, he went. He he. He went to. Well, I didn't ever tell you that. We went to Alaska on that sabbatical. Well, I mentioned the sabbatical. I think. No, you hadn't. No. So we went a year sabbatical to Alaska and did a study. Well, David was with us, and so he got a, 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 fell in love with Alaska. So he started going back there and working as a, on the refuge in the summer times and with the game and fish department. And could have had a job with them, and uh, and so then, uh, but in the meantime, he'd met a beautiful young lady, and uh, when he was with us in Durango at Fort Lewis College, uh, uh, Pam Smith, Pamela Smith, and and they were in touch with each other, and, and so they finally were married, but in Alaska, because that's where he was and on the job. We went up to Alaska for that wedding, and. Uh, uh, so he's married Pamela, and uh, they have a wonderful family. They have two sons, and uh, 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 those those sons are now married, and uh, they uh, they want to, and both of them have a have a girl, uh, less a year or so old. One's less a year, and one's a little more than a year old. So if my math is right, you've got six grandchildren That's right. and six great grandchildren. That's right. Uh, uh. Yeah, you're pretty good at math. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's uh, well, that's what our family is. But one of the things of interesting things, maybe uh, or at least uh, significant things to yeah. our family is, we have tried to do some major family ac uh, uh, adventures, and there's really three of them. One was for our fiftieth wedding anniversary. We took the whole crew to Alaska for, uh -huh. for a month. They had to arrange that. Can you imagine people arranging that ahead of time? Terry at Lockheed Martin in Denver, yeah, right. and his wife teaching. Of course, this is going to be in summertime, yeah. so she was off. And uh, Dave uh, uh, working for uh, well, at that time he was working for Sinclair. He was a, he became a chemical engineer, and uh, got his master's that way. And he he. Uh, was working for Sinclair in, in uh, Rollins, Wyoming. And uh, but, so they got the time off, and their kids, of course, could. And so, uh, so all, all uh, uh, 12 of us went in two vans to uh -huh. Alaska for a month. <laughs> and had a wonderful time, flew out to a, uh, to a cabin and a float plane, first time uh -huh. any of ever been in a float plane. And, and stayed there for a couple, three days in a cabin there, and went to Denali and in a wilderness cabin. And mm. See how the cabins come into this? Yeah, thing? right. And, and, now, and now David has built his own cabin up near uh, uh, Wyoming, and, and then camp, near a camp mm -hmm. in Wyoming, and up uh, about 10,000 feet elevation, cut his own logs mm. on his property, and uh, and has built it and made notched it himself all his notches and <laughs> he even got a little sawmill there he makes his flooring with and windows and however he worked for Sinclair he worked for uh, Mark or uh, Williams Company processing natural gas his career was in Williams Company processing natural gas as a chemical engineer. And he just he just graduated. He just uh, retired. retired from that. So, so that he still has some work to do on the cabin. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the grandkids are, are pride and joy. We we enjoy. We just 
appreciate all of them. And, uh, but it's uh, Gina and Corey and uh, and uh, Matt and Tricia and and uh, Steph and Joe and wow. and uh, and we did one unmarried, and that's that's uh, uh, that's uh, John, and he's the one that got the master the the uh, business degree at CSU. So he's head over heels in business. And then uh, it's, we have uh, uh, Nathaniel and uh, Christopher with uh, Becca and Jamie. And I'll name the grandkids, wow. if I can. Wow. <laughs> okay, it's uh, uh, in, in order, this is, I think this is in order. Ryan, he's I think about eight. Uh, uh, Keegan, she's six. Uh, Jacob, he's less than a year old. Uh, uh, Lily Ann, she's a little over a year old and she's in Arkansas. Uh, uh, Lydia, she's a little over a year old, she's in Wyoming. And, uh, and Elon, you got him. <laughs> well, she's <laughs> she's a little less. You're, she's half year old. She's in Wyoming. And uh, uh, wow. Oh, and there's one on the way too. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> oh, I was telling you about these trips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one to Alaska, and but then there's another one. We went to Hawaii for our 60th wedding anniversary. <laughs> We, act, we don't actually go on the anniversary because that's, uh, it's a much better time to go other time right. here. So we, we took them to Hawaii. We went to Maui, all 12 of us, for two weeks. Mm. And, uh, and uh, did the whole bit. Uh, uh, oh, it was a wonderful time. It's a wonderful time of getting together as a, uh, I'm sorry. To, now the third one is Lake Powell. We all went to Lake Powell and rented a houseboat mm. and uh, a motorboat and one or two uh, jet skis and oh, wow. had a wonderful three or four days there. And sent, now our kids do that themselves for their families and even our grandson this last uh, summer, took a bunch of his business buddies <laughs> and, and did a houseboat thing, uh, like Paul. Wow. <laughs> through through the years, did you ever have a chance to to travel to Europe and retrace your steps at all, or didn't retrace our <laughs> steps? But we did have a chance to go to Europe, and uh, uh, we did. Uh, this was in nineteen. Uh, 2001, mm -hmm. 2001, Marion and I, well, that's another interesting story though. Uh, the, uh, one of our trips to Alaska, we've made 10 trips to Alaska, every way you can imagine, all the way from about a four day trip for that wedding to a year and a half trip for my sabbatical. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, one of the trips to Alaska, we were in Sitka and going into, looking in the museum and a nice looking young man walked up to Marion and said, uh, uh, are, are you uh, from Drago? Yeah, your name's Steinhoff? Yes, my name's Steinhoff. We met a Steinhoff from Germany in Sitka, Alaska. We've been friends with ever since. Huh. And they invited us over there. So we went over to, and did Europe in the meantime. We went, went to Rotenburg on their recommendation, which is a ancient German town that has the old flavor with balls around it. Wonderful place to start where you can eat uh, wild boar in the restaurant and stuff like that. We went to, uh, went to uh, uh, Switzerland, had a wonderful time there, got the Cog Railway and stuff like that. And uh, then we went up to their house. They put us up, they have a bed and breakfast, put us up there. And he took me around a little bit in Germany, but no, we didn't visit any of the mm. old places we did see Europe a little bit. That's yeah. our only Europe trip. But otherwise, we've gone 10 times to Alaska and about eight times to Hawaii. Wow, oh, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. 
Through, through the years, did you ever keep in touch uh, with any of the guys you served with? Was there any sort of reunions, anything like that? Uh, yes. Yes, the 942nd had, still does have re reunions. And I'm not sure they have them every year now. And I did go to only one of them. It was in, in uh, Las Vegas. I'm not sure what year that was, but uh, it was wonderful to, uh, to mingle with fellows that you knew in various roles, different mm -hmm. roles. Mm -hmm. And they, when they come back, they, they, then they take their civilian roles. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's so interesting to see the difference and how uh, get acquainted with them again. Yeah, we did that. And otherwise, by correspondence and by newsletter, we kept in touch with, with uh, a lot of those. And I still keep in touch with my best friend, who was a he was a, he was a drafts he was a captain in charge of the draftsmen. Uh, company in, in, in England. Uh, Kenny Lowe was his name, Kenneth Lowe. I'm still in touch with him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Well, Harold, as, as we start to wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about uh, or any of the stories that have floated to the top as we've been sitting here talking so that ideally we, we round out your story as best we can, or do you think, by and large, we, we captured a good chunk of it? I think you captured a good chunk of it. I think one of the more interesting things to me is, as I look back at it, and for our, uh, incidentally, for our 70th wedding anniversary a couple of years ago, uh, we showed a set of, of uh, of, of uh, pictures of the cabins we lived in. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting, that's sort of a life story in itself. Is it, yeah? It tells a lot about what our life has been like. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, I guess that's the only guy I could think of offhand. Okay, all right. Well, uh, the last question I always like to ask with with these interviews, and, and I think you've been kind of answering it all along, but uh, maybe you can wrap it up and, and maybe wrap up with a, a closing thought you'd like to, to leave with this is that time you had, you spent in the, in the military and everything you experienced, how did that, did that uh, affect your life, change your life, play a role in your life, or do you look at it as simply just a chapter in your life that you went through? How would, how would you answer that? Well, it affected it profoundly uh, because as I, as I tried to explain a little bit, it, 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 uh, decide, uh, how, uh, it guided how I, how I uh, met my wife, right. which is the yeah. key thing yeah. in my life, and had a family that as a result of that yeah. that is also a key thing. But woven into that is the earlier background that I was led into and that I got into in, in interest in, in natural resources and in, in wildlife and in t timber, which led to air photos, which led to see how that led to so yeah, many right, threads. Right, yeah. The, 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 the interwoven and, and uh, so you have a life full of those kind of things. And, yeah. And, uh, I guess that's, that's, and so I guess the thing is, uh, yeah, take advantage of what you have when you have it and think about it and think. Thinking is a, of course I'm an old teacher, but thinking is the most important thing you'll ever do. And Think about it purposely and intensively and intentionally. Don't just let things happen. Yeah. Very good. Well, Harold, I want to thank you for sitting down to, to tell an incredible story, but I also want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for coming and doing this. I appreciate it, Brad.